over the past <clears throat> five years, two-thirds of global growth has come from developing countries. And as recently as the 90s, that number would have been in the 20s. And U.S. exports in 10 years have gone from 25% to developing countries to 50%. So you got, combined with what we heard about Europe and, in a sense, the demographic problems in Japan, you got a big shift in the international system here going on. And a lot of those countries will also have challenges like in China with the avoiding the middle income trap and the structural shift. But what I want to connect to is the stuff that we're doing at home in the United States actually isn't enough. The United States then needs an international economic strategy, some of the things that Prime Minister Asnar was talking about, so that it can leverage a domestic revival with a new international growth system because the old system is no longer going to exist in the old form. And you've got these rising economies and you know you got you got markets there. To Africa grew at five to six percent a year for for a decade before the crisis, and is now back on the growth trajectory. So there's opportunities in every one of those developing markets. Can, but can these developing markets keep up the pace of growth that they that that they've demonstrated in the last ten years? We're already seeing China slow down. Is the last ten years a signal of what we're going to see over the next? It, it varies by economy. China will slow down the population. The simple the one child policy means you got less labor coming into the market, and that goes to this critical issue of what we did with our report with China about the middle income trap, how you increase, keep, keep productivity, how you keep growth going when you start to get five to six, seven thousand dollars a year per capita income. Now this actually creates opportunities because some of the things they're going to have to do, for example, would be open the service sector, which should actually help the United States. The, the trade patterns, the logistics, the supply chains, the investment. I was talking with one of the CEOs today or yes, last night who's you know, major company was bought out by a Chinese company. You're going to see a whole, what's important for the people to recognize is not just in trade or growth, but whether it's investment, remittances, tourism, supply and logistics change, the system is going to go through a transformation. Each of those provide actually some opportunities. Austin, growth. 2013. Well, look, the coming? U.S. has been growing, yeah. you know, maybe 2%, which is not good, and that's the fastest of pretty much the whole advanced world. And I mean, that tells you what is what is wrong and has been wrong. Uh, it's a mess for most of the developed uh, But what do you make of this world. answer? We have... Uh, well, so the, if you look at the U.S. context, other than the six to nine months of bumpiness, I think the prospects are not bad in the U.S. The fact that major companies are investing is likely a forward-looking indicator. With the populations up about 10 million since the recession started, household formation has been close to zero. We got way overbuilt in housing. Historically, housing related, call it construction, real estate, some you know household oriented manufacturing, is about a third of a normal expansion. It's a highly cyclical part of the economy and we've gotten literally zero from that for multiple years. So as we start to turn the corner, even if it doesn't go back to the go-go days of the 2000s, um, that's still going to add some significant component to the growth rate in the U.S. And you know we could probably get up someplace well above two percent. So I don't, I don't think these, I don't think those numbers are are that surprising. I, I do think, on average, emerging markets tend to grow faster. They start from a low base. But when they go wrong, they go terribly wrong. That, I mean, that's the history of, of investment in emerging markets. I think it's in our area. We want them to keep growing the way they've been growing. I, I mean, as Bob said, that's the, the Europe's at best going to be stagnant in the medium term. Japan has had well-documented growth problems. And so it has to come from the emerging markets theater. I mean, if we're going to shift to exports and investment-led growth, it's going to naturally be to those markets. Michael, is this yeah. a vote of confidence in the U.S. economy? Yeah, I, I'm not sure I, that you can just take those numbers at face value. Half of corporate investment is replacement investment. I like to know where the existing investment is. And right. those, those yeah. percentages should be compared to their base uh, as well. So, well, this is we asked them where they're increasing investment and hiring the most, but yeah, still a lot of a lot of the yeah, might but, be here. But the, the increase could be because they've got a lot of stuff they're replacing. It's just right. You right. increase it 10 percent, but that doesn't mean that all of it is uh, is new stuff. Okay. Um, second of all, uh, the U.S. is has a variety of things that could lead us to stronger growth. We should be growing 
at over 4% for several years out of such a deep recession compared to previous deep uh, uh, recoveries from previous deep recessions. It's been delayed for a variety of reasons. It's probably not worth arguing about that, the causes here. Uh, I think some of it was policy, pro probably more than Austin would, but we can skip that. Uh, in Asia, uh, I think the big issue is China. Uh, and I think they're going through a leadership transition and whether they're going to embrace the kinds of reforms that uh, the World Bank and China Development Research uh, uh, Foundation group suggested, de-emphasizing state enterprises, emphasizing domestic demand relative to, to exports, um, and a variety of things of that sort, land and labor and financial reforms. Uh, the pace of that is still very much up in the air. So, uh, and the good news is uh, if they have a financial or real estate set of problems, they have such large foreign reserves, 3.3 trillion, at such a high saving rate that they can, and in a political system that can cover it, okay, rather than fight about it. So I think that this is somewhat revelatory, but, uh, but not dispositive. I think the U.S. has puts and takes. I think the fiscal cliff is one. I think continued deleveraging, the continued difficulty of small and medium-sized businesses and getting capital is a, is a big drag. Um, but on the other hand, you've got energy prices low. You've got, or low relatively, you've got, uh, especially for natural gas, you've got um, housing having apparently hit bottom and starting to turn. Uh, so there are a variety of things. You've got a lot of money on the sidelines.